guys, it's me Anup from Amron Crypto and today we are very much happy to have a very well-known individual on our channel, Zimmy Song. Zimmy is a Bitcoin educator, developer, entrepreneur and I'm pretty much sure that you guys know Jimmy very well. In this video, we'll be focusing mainly on Bitcoin but we will also talk about what's going on at the market and what's going to happen for Bitcoin in 2019 and also the Lightning Network, Bitcoin Proof of Key, which we heard recently. Bitcoin Cash and also talk about the upcoming Ethereum hard fork. So this video is going to be pure informative and interesting so stay with me till the end guys. And talking about Jimmy, I personally like Jimmy very well because I enjoy watching his video. It's very informative and educational and also it's honesty. So guys, by saying this, let's welcome Jimmy Song. So Jimmy, how are you doing? I am great. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a lot of fun doing these shows and you know like I, I love how the internet connects the entire world, right? Like it, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can you can you can broadcast and basically make TV shows wherever. And it's I, I'm glad you're doing this, and I'm happy to be on your show. Thank you very much. So first thing first, we all know that the 2018 has taught us a very valuable lesson. And talking about the crypto market at the moment, where do you see the market is heading at the moment? Did we hit the bottom? Um, I don't think we've hit the bottom, and I'll tell you why. Uh, there was a lot of malinvestment in 2017 and 2018, in particular into ICOs that haven't delivered anything. Um, the the lifespan of an ICO, I think, is uh, is such that you know it takes a few years before they get any sort of product out. Um, so we saw that with Augur, for example. Augur Augur is like kind of a poster child of like I, how I expect ICOs to go, and I. I I count Augur as one of the successful ones. They they had 400 daily active users uh, when they first launched. They're down to like 25, which is insanely low, right? Like most apps, like the most apps on almost any phone or any any um, app on your uh, on your PC or something like that, they got way more than 25. And uh, and for them to for that to be considered a quote unquote success on the Ethereum network uh, tells you all you need to know about the actual usage of these things. So there's been a tremendous amount of malinvestment and all of that needs to clear out. And if you if you read about, you know, business cycle theory and, th and things like that, what happens is during a bull market, a lot of investment goes towards things that really don't deserve it. And a lot of that money has to clear first before another bull run can start. Um, so it, it's going to take a while for that stuff to clear. And like the market caps I'm seeing on some of these coins still are still insanely high. I mean, I, I don't think Stellar is worth more than a billion dollars. That's just ridiculous. Um, so until that stuff clears uh, and like a lot of that malinvestment clears, a lot of those resources are freed, a lot of those developers, a lot of those entrepreneurs are pursuing more fruitful endeavors um, and you know have sort of bottomed out it's uh, I, I don't think we've hit bottom so I, I, I know that's probably not what you want to hear you want to hear okay it's gonna bounce back and we're gonna hit new all-time highs in the next week but uh, but that's just not reality and that's not how the economy tends to work so yeah, that's, that's, I, who knows that's what I like about you your honesty that's right so and, and I'm sure you already heard about like many market experts who are claiming specifically for the price of Bitcoin will go below like $3,000 or could go even like below $2,000. Even Tone said that Bitcoin could go mm -hmm. below $2,000. So mm -hmm. and, and he said if Bitcoin goes below $2,000, he's going heavy on it. So does this mm -hmm. mean that the price, go, price of Bitcoin is going lower? What's your take on that since you are also a Bitcoin maximalist? Yeah, I, my, my gut feeling is that we'll go lower, but like um, it, it's more a side effect of everything else going lower. Um, like so when you when you have all these ICOs that people want to get out of, typically um, uh, and this is something that Tone and I have observed for years now, is that like if you own some Litecoin or I don't know, zero X coin or whatever crap coin ICO, whatever that you have, you also tend to also own some Bitcoin. And uh, people tend to treat that whole investment in a block. So when they sell um, all of these altcoins or ICOs, they also sell their Bitcoin. And that, that, that it's sort of like this cascading effect. Um, and, you know, they, they have to funnel it through Bitcoin first and then they, they, they sell it. Uh, so there, there tends to be sort of downward pressure on a Bitcoin price as these things clear. 
Um, and that's perfectly fine. That that's a normal part of the market cycle, and uh, and it's something that you know, like if you're going to be an investor in Bitcoin for a while, you you really need to get used to it because th this thing is completely normal uh, for this sort of asset. And uh, I've gone through like four bear markets now, oh, and man. it is completely normal, right? It's completely normal. It and we've had bigger drops than this. We've had more sudden drops than this. We've had longer drops than this. Um, it, it, it's it's a it's a normal part of the cycle, but a lot of this stuff has to clear out. I, I mean, the last bull market came after all of these altcoins, like there, uh, you know, late 2013. There was like a hype in all of these other coins as well. So Litecoin went from something like two dollars to like forty something dollars. You know, Namecoin went from a few cents to like uh you know five ten dollars something like that there were a lot of coins that did stuff like that and then only when they dropped back down to their previous level so litecoin went from two dollars to forty dollars back down to two dollars did and it was there for like a year before the bull market started again so um I'm I'm kind of expecting something like that and uh and you know like Litecoin right now is trading at around, like I think around 35 bucks or something like that. I, I mean, I that that's the one gauge I'm looking at kind of closely because I I expect it to drop more than 30 like more than the previous high and uh, because uh that's how all coins work. Uh Bitcoin tends to hit the previous high before it it, it goes up, which is why tones Expecting somewhere between thirteen hundred and three thousand to be the bottom, somewhere somewhere around there. Um, for all coins, it tends to be lower than the previous high. So, uh, you know, Litecoin's previous high was forty dollars. It's already dipped below that, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm I'm expecting it to dip even below that. And that's one of the better projects. Like some of the other stuff, it's going to it's going to go down even further. Um, you know, I, e Ethereum really hasn't had a bear market ever because it came in during the bull market. Um, so I, I'm not sure how that one's going to react. But a, a lot of malinvestment just simply has to clear. And that, that takes a long time. And when it's going to happen, I don't know. How low it's going to go, I don't know. But, uh, but I, I think there's a lot more pain to go. I actually once watched in a video and where you said like Bitcoin is like most recent lies and uh, like a crypto and secure crypto, ICOs and other Bitcoin hub folks are like more decentralized. But why do you think that Bitcoin is so different compared to others? Uh, I, I mean, uh, a large part of it is because it's already lasted 10 years. Uh, I, I don't know when you're going to release this video, but today is yeah. January 4th. Right. And, you know, that's one day after the 10 year anniversary of the Genesis block. So it's lasted the longest. And, uh, and you know, the only real thing that can test any system is time. Um, because especially any economic system, because people try to find exploits and try to f figure out ways to make money off of it. Um, there hasn't been that like period of time for almost every other coin. Like they, they just haven't lasted that long and they haven't been tested or stress tested. Um, you know, there haven't been attacks against it and so on. I mean, a, a lot of coins have been attacked and they've gone away as a result. I mean, we, we don't really talk about Verge anymore. I, I don't think there's any development going on, exactly. in part because they, they were 51% attacked and so on. Um, but uh, there, there's uh, the biggest thing that Bitcoin brings that everything else does not is decentralization. And that decentralization is the result of a lot of those 10 years. Uh, Satoshi created it. It was sort of... Uh, it was very new at the time. Nobody knew about it. Every other altcoin launch, everyone knows about it, right? Like it's and like people sort of speculate on it instead of the organic growth that Bitcoin had. Everything else has like sort of this marketing and hype based growth, which is very different. Um, and as a result, uh, Bitcoin has had, uh, you know, and of course, Satoshi left. And that 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 decentralized things significantly because before that, Satoshi was the main uh, code uh, contributor and releaser and made decisions and so on. And you can see that in a lot of other coins today. Vitalik makes all the decisions for Ethereum. And, you know, Charlie makes a lot of the decisions for Litecoin and so on. And, you know, uh, like whatever structure EOS has, you know, like they, you know, like all, all of them have a, have some centralized entity that does it. And that's not very interesting um, because that's not very different than fiat or any other centralized currency uh, where where somebody 
uh, dictates what what's going to happen on that network. So for me, Bitcoin is the only one that's actually like credibly decentralized. Almost everything else is not. It, it's 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 uh, it's you know like basically somebody's science experiment or money printing machine or something else. And for that reason, I I, I mean like some of them are very technically interesting, and I pay attention to them for that reason. Uh, but as far as monetary policy goes. Bitcoin is the one that is good. Um, almost everything else has some centralized component. And until proven otherwise, I'm, I'm not going to think of them as decentralized. For me, like also like Bitcoin is a, actually a store of value, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And security definitely is the primary thing for now. But what happened a mm -hmm. few months ago, when you look like Bitcoin Cash Hub folk, we saw the hash war between Bitcoin and Satoshi Division and Bitcoin ABC trying to like prove who is better than who, but did they actually affect the Bitcoin ecosystem according to you? And also for Bitcoin Cash, for example, if you look, which keeps increasing the block size, do you think that's necessary? No, I don't, I don't think it's necessary at all. I mean, look, you look at their block usage and it's like 100K. I, I, I saw um, a project, uh, some sort of like book stock cash or something like that, where uh, somebody was literally putting uh, the text of books into the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. So they put the entire text of Animal Farm into the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. And, and they were bragging about it. And RBTC was saying, oh, this is great, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, really, that's what you want this for, right? Like, um, you know, like you could do this about a thousand times cheaper by putting it on your computer in some sort of zipped archive or something. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, they 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 they're putting it on their blockchain as and like pretending that this is amazing or something like that. Like uh, the government's gonna seize all our hard drives and you know this is this is the only way we're gonna get it or something. It, it's ridiculous. All right, like uh, you don't need block sizes that big, and you don't need. Uh, I mean, the the hash war was a complete joke because yeah. <laughs> both sides were going to like not let the other one attack it. Uh, it, it you there there's a there's a Bitcoin command line command, uh, which is uh, disconnect block, which says, OK, you know what? Like this block, if, if it, I, I don't like it and it, it, it's, it doesn't belong on the blockchain, it'll, it'll wipe that whole, whole side out. And if enough people do that or if it's sort of centrally uh, enforced with something like a checkpoint, which is what Bitcoin ABC did, then, then you, you basically thwarted the attack. And... That's the nice thing about being centralized is that you can thwart attacks like that very easily. But you've given up decentralization completely in order to do that. And that's what both sides kind of did. And the hash war, in a sense, was kind of a pissing contest. It, did, it didn't matter at all. And uh, neither side was going to attack the other, at least successfully. I mean, they might have tried or something like that. But I mean, who, like nobody, nobody really cares like yeah. whether or not you did. And uh, and really, the the only thing that matters uh, or that seemed to matter was who was trading how much for what and how much of the economic value was on each chain. Uh, but again, they're both fiat to me because they're both centralized. So why are they interesting at all? I'm not, I mean, did it affect Bitcoin price? Maybe a little bit because there was sort sort of like ASICs going back and forth. Uh, some of some of the hashing power was rented on one side and. Um, a lot of miners were having a difficult time making profits off of the uh, off of the mining equipment that they had at the time. So perhaps that 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 did affect the ecosystem a little bit. But as far as Bitcoin ABC and Bitcoin SV go, completely uninteresting to me. Um, and it's it's just it's there. There are 84 other hard forks of Bitcoin and uh, none of them are interesting either because they're all centralized. But like uh, scalability or like the Lightning Network and also like for Bitcoin Lightning Network set a new record we saw in regarding to its capacity breaking like through like threshold of 510 BTC. And mm -hmm. the same time I read that an article was stated like Roger were offered 1.25 million to open node to the Lightning Network software company to build on top of Bitcoin Cash. But they declined stating that <laughs> our vision of a better, more open finance system is only possible with Bitcoin. And I think that's uh, really like a really yeah, strong I, answer. Yeah, right. Roger's a joke, and uh, I wouldn't take anything that he says at his word because he might have offered it 
quote unquote. But he also <laughs> offered me a bet and he hasn't followed through on it at all. And he, he, he just sort of like weasels out of it. So I mean, like it, it's just a smart move to not uh, not build on Bitcoin Cash for those guys. Besides, like they um, they have they still have transaction malleability on Bitcoin ABC because they didn't implement SegWit. Any any of the scripts can be malleated by any miner at any time. So um, until you fix that, you can't really have lightning very easily unless like, uh, you know, like you, you, you do something very centralized and forceful and tyrannical, uh, which they might do. That's that's their prerogative if they want to. Um, but uh, but yeah, it, it to me that that entire uh, thing is a joke. And uh, I, I like. Do not take Roger at his word because he's he's not good on good for it. So, uh, you know what, like whatever he says about Lightning and oh, implementing X, Y, or Z on Bitcoin Cash, this is his way of trying trying to throw his uh, influence around. Um, I, I like yeah, I, he he's he's yeah. Do not pay attention to that guy. He he doesn't he he's. He's, he's not worth <laughs> none of his words are worth anything. We'll come about that in later though. So but recently we heard about the Bitcoin proof of like keys from Trace Mayers and how yeah. do you like find the ideas like creating financial independence with Bitcoin? But I guess like for major exchanges seems to be not ready for this kind of proof of movement, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um yeah I, I, I suspect at least some exchanges are doing some sort of fractional reserve banking, right? Like uh um you know, like claiming to have more Bitcoins than they do. And then like, or I mean, they're they're more or less bankrupt and they're trying to prevent the run on the bank. And I think that was what Trace was trying to do. But if you're a, a hardcore Bitcoiner or if you if, if you really understand Bitcoin, you, you realize you have to possess your own Bitcoin and uh, and it's important to do so. Uh, so you should have probably had all of your money out of these exchanges way before um, January 3rd. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I get it. Like there, there are people that want to, uh, you know, like that, that aren't technical and things like that. And this is more a UX problem, software problem, product problem. This is where if you're an entrepreneur, this is a great yeah. place to come in and try to provide solutions that make sense for everybody. Um, because you will get paid for it. And this is how the market's supposed to work. It's uh, it's based on demand from users and not based on some central party saying, oh, you know, can you build this for me? I'll give you a bunch of money, um, which is exactly what Roger's trying to do on Bitcoin Cash, right? Like that that's a very centralized model where it's like a top down, please build this for me. And, uh, you know, I think this will make the ecosystem better. Uh, instead of actual user demand, the market dictating what what should be created. Um, in a sense, Roger's too much of the market or the centralized players are too much of the market in a lot of these altcoins um, instead of the actual people that are storing value in Bitcoin. Like in Bitcoin, it's the users that are storing value. They demand certain solutions. And that's how those work. And market mechanisms tend to work a lot better than centrally controlled things like uh, in a lot of these other ones. So, yeah, like talking about uh, previously what you said about altcoins, like since we know that ICOs and other many projects have like failed to prove themselves and more than 80% of them have already disappeared. And I recently watched mm -hmm. a video from where Roger said, Ver said that ICOs will be the key thing and it's going to evolve in 2019. Like, and although like nearly 1,000 of crypto projects have been declared dead, like, do you think maybe he knows something we don't, or what do you think about this? Oh, uh, I, he probably does know something that we don't, which is that he's probably gonna try to launch an ICO on Bitcoin Cash or something. I, I, I don't know. He probably is going to pump something. And again, like this, this is not a guy whose word you should really trust. He's one, a politician, he twists every word uh, that other people say and so on. He misrepresents things. He's not honest. And why would you listen yeah. to a guy that simply can't be honest, right? Like he uh, and when he says stuff like that and he, uh, and I, I've, I've tracked him for a couple of years, um, he, he says outlandish things as a way to manipulate others. Um, and this is something that you should be very careful of in this industry because there are a lot of people that want to manipulate you for their own gain. 
if they can get you pumped about a particular coin, then they can make a lot of money off of it by printing a lot of that money, uh, that coin themselves, which is probably what Roger is referring to. Uh, you know, saying that this the year of the ICO probably is an indicator that he's going to do some sort of ICO, whether it's on Ethereum or Bitcoin Cash or some side chain. I, don't, I, I have no idea. But whatever it is, it's going to happen. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you, you have to sort of look at it through the lens of, what is going to happen here, right? Like, what is he trying to accomplish um, instead of, oh, Roger says this is going to happen, so it must happen. Um, no, he's trying to manipulate you so that he can gain in some way or his coin can gain in some way or something like that. And, you know, I mean, it's perfectly his prerogative to do that. But whether or not you should trust him, it, it, you, you have to put it through some filters. You know what I mean? So and I just remember I just remember about the bet you made with Joseph Lubin and you said like <laughs> Joseph Lubin did not finish the bet on a like decentralized application or bet which you made related to evolution of three centralized application I guess and I saw your tweet so this means you are leading it so far isn't it? Yeah, I mean I I've I, I've uh, like basically we we shook hands at consensus yeah. in May. And he, uh, I, I've tried to contact him multiple times. He would not respond. I finally uh, convinced Laura Shin to have us on both together. Um, and we thought we were going to finalize the bet then. Um, he backed out last minute. And then like, I've been like contacting him. Like I, I email him pretty often and he doesn't respond. He just doesn't, uh, or he'll respond like, like three weeks later, right? Like, and he's like, oh, I'm busy. You know, I have other things to do. It's like, Dude, like, and I, I've had employees of Consensus, his own company, come up to me and say, like, dude, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. Like, he should have made this bet with you. Like, like he went on stage, right? Like, um, and I'm like, and, uh, and you know, he'll, he, there, there was an article in The New Yorker. There was an article yeah, in uh, Breaker Mag. I mean, multiple articles about this bet. And every time they ask him, like, have you finalized this bet? What's going on with the bet? And he's like, oh, you know, we're, we're uh, there. There's some terms that, you know, we, we still have to finalize or whatever. It's complete bull crap. What he's doing is stalling. That's why we, we haven't finished the finished the bet. Uh, so I like basically he he's lying to the media to uh, make himself look good. Um, I like I, I have a feeling he's not he's not like so right after the bet was made or like we, we shook hands and stuff like that. Uh, several people told me right afterwards, he's never going to complete that bet with you. I was like, how did you how do you know? And they were like, there are certain tells about certain people uh, and, uh, you know, how they behave. Um, so in particular, a lot of people that listen to the podcast with Laura Shin, they told me, OK, he's never going to finish that bet with you. You know how I know? is because he scoffed at you at towards the end. This is how people get out of bets. So I, I said, OK, well, I, I'm willing to bet 100 Bitcoin. And he's, he just sort of scoffed and said, oh, why so little? That that was to them like a very clear indicator. People don't do that unless they want to appear like that's too little or like they're they're too above this. That's their way to get out of a bet. And uh, and, you know, they were like, He's never going to bet with you because he doesn't believe in his own uh, uh, own side. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I just sort of hit him on the head with it every once in a while. And that that that's that's the utility get, I get out of it. If you actually believed it, we would have we would have finished that bet back in like June at the uh, at the latest. Uh, the fact of the matter is he doesn't believe in his own product. He, he has no idea how Ethereum is going to scale. He, he doesn't believe in most of his portfolio companies. Um, and, you know, e Ethereum just isn't what everyone thinks it is. And it's it's built mostly on hype. Looking at the tweet from uh, Vitalik Buterin, he said that he doesn't believe in the consensus like proof of work. Like, what do you have to say <laughs> on that? Like, do you think it's due to the issue like avoiding like creating a wrong way, hashing power fight and so on? But if you look at proof of stake, we also have issue regarding the private keys, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, so here, here's the thing about Vitalik that a lot of people don't know. Um, like, if you look at like Ethereum's design from a technical perspective, it uses... He tries to use everything that was either invented there or within like the last two years, that sort of thing. He's a 
He's what Nasib Taleb would call a neomaniac. He likes new things. And he wanted to do everything his way, new and different. Um, contrast that to something like Bitcoin. And you look at Satoshi's technical decisions. And they were always based on stuff that has lasted a long time already. And uh, so, for example, use the OpenSSL library to do a lot of the checking, right? Like instead of writing his own. Um, uh, he, he also used like, uh, you know, the DIR signature format, the SEC format. These were all standards that existed for years before Bitcoin ever existed. And th those were all put into the protocol. You look at Ethereum. They're like, okay, we're going to make everything new. We know better and stuff like that. And, and I, I, I'd hate to say it, but this is, this is a mistake that a lot of young engineers make. And, um, and I've been a software engineer for like 20 years, right? Like I've been coding um, since like 98 or whatever. And, you know, th this is your tendency when you, when you get started is, oh, you know what? I can make something better. And then you don't realize like all of the, um, the, the time that it's lasted tends to harden a protocol, right? Um, so when you have a library that does a particular serialization, they know all of the edge cases. They know how to handle all of the different um, contingencies and things like that. And time proves that out. Uh, whereas if you make something new, there, there tends to be a lot of edge cases and stuff that you don't handle. And that causes a lot of bugs. And, um, and for... Uh, for, you know, like a website that you launch in six weeks or something like that, that sort of thing is perfectly fine, right? Like, because the worst thing that happens, a user sees like a, uh, an error on a web page, who cares, right? Like, um, all right, one out of a hundred, that's fine. Like, uh, you know, as long as you can iterate and stuff like that. You can't do that with a cryptocurrency because you do that with cryptocurrency, people lose a lot of money, like the DAO hack or the parity bug or whatever, right? Like, and... And, uh, and, you know, I mean, you got, you got to realize, like, Vitalik's a pretty young kid. I mean, like, he doesn't have really, like, any experience, like, coding, really, like, in any sort of industrial setting. And, uh, and he came into this thing thinking, okay, well, I'm going to make everything new. Um, you know, even, like, the Ethereum address format, it doesn't have any checksum. Now, that's idiotic, right? Because, uh, like, you, you flip one letter, like, from a capital to a lowercase, all your money disappears, right? And part part of like the Bitcoin base 58 design, I hate the base 58 design, by the way, but one of the virtues of it is that it detects if you have the wrong character because there's a checksum at the end. Um, instead, Vital Vitalik in his quote unquote wisdom decided, you know what, address format has no checksum. So uh, if you paste a uh, you know, address wrong or, you know, you, you flip one letter or something like that, all your money disappears. I, like, <sighs> like, I mean, that's a total face palm, right? Like from an engineering standpoint, that's like a mistake, like, uh, you know, someone like one year out of school would make. Um, and, and like from an engineering perspective, it's, it's horrible. It's uh, like, like that, like what, what script kitty made this? Um, and that's kind of how Ethereum is designed. And, uh, and that that's so when he says stuff like I don't believe in proof of work, it's because of his neomania. He sees proof of work as something belonging to Bitcoin, something that's old. He wants to do something new. He sees proof of stake or uh, some hybrid or sharding or whatever. I mean, this is why like Ethereum constantly talks about new ideas or whatever. Um, but really what, what they're talking about is uh, it, it, it's it's their neomania in action. And that's that's completely against security because the more complex you make it, the larger the attack surface is. Complexity is the enemy of security for a reason. Keeping things simple, keeping things known, keeping things uh, you know like um, that have been tested, that have done things uh, a, a certain way for a long time. That's the that's the model that you should be going with with something like a financial product. Um, instead, he's treating it like a website, which is probably what he grew up with or uh, if he's done any coding at all, what, what he's done. So I, I don't know, like it, it's uh, like as a coder, it offends me that Ethereum gets as much respect as it does uh, because it's not very well designed. It's not from an engineering perspective, very good in any sense of the word.
<laughs> Thanks for the great insight. So, <laughs> so, so what do you want to say to people who are watching this interview right now? Like why they should hold on to their Bitcoin according to you? Yeah, I, I mean, so it depends, right? If, if Bitcoin might not be for you. If you're, if you're in it for the short term, if, you're, if you have a, a, a high time preference or, you know, you need to pay rent next month or something like that, what, what, whatever, like if you're going into credit card debt so you can invest in Bitcoin, probably not a good idea, right? Like that might not be something, Bitcoin might not be something for you. Um, I see Bitcoin as a store of value and store of value means that you can store it for a long time. And there are very few things that compete with Bitcoin on that front. Um, you have something like maybe stocks, maybe real estate, things like that. But those things tend, uh, stocks are relatively liquid, but they're, they're also hard to choose and you can do index funds and stuff like that, but then it, depends on the broader market and depends on like uh, government intervention. And, and, like there, there's a lot of ways in which it can get manipulated. Um, yeah, real estate tends to not be very liquid, uh, although it is very scarce because they don't really make more land. So that, that's kind of nice, but it's not really fungible either. Uh, for me, Bitcoin is a very good store of value. And that means being able to hold on to your value. Now, if you have money or you have wealth, that you want to store in something that's uh, that's not going to be confiscated away from you, um, then Bitcoin is the right choice, and that that that's who I would appeal to. If you are looking to speculate on it, oh, it might go up in six months. Um, probably not for you, right? Like, uh, and you're taking out like a second mortgage against your home in order to like go and go and invest in it. Probably not for you. Uh, but if, if you're in a country where, you know, like they might do some sort of bail in or, uh, you know, like that you, you have to take a haircut uh, off your bank balance or something like that, or you're going through hyperinflation or, or even in regular inflation and you have wealth, this might be it for you, right? Like Bitcoin might be the thing to use it. Um, and over a five year time frame, almost everyone's done pretty well in Bitcoin. Uh, uh, like, I mean, you, you couldn't have done badly as long as you held. Um, and that's the kind of play that you have to think of it as. Uh, it's, it's not a short term play, it's a long term play. Just like Robert Kiyosaki said, like we have three types of money. First is God's money, which is like gold and silver. Second is the governmental money, it's like fiat. And, and people's money, which is cryptocurrency. So guys, preserve and hold on to what you have <laughs> because you don't have to be a developer or a programmer to contribute in this ecosystem. Just by holding on to your investment as a holder, that's also a kind of investment or and contribution, guys. So thank you, Jimmy, so much for your time. And thank you, everyone who is watching this right now. But before we say goodbye, guys, if you want to contribute to like Bitcoin as a developer and still having problem getting started, then you can go uh, and sign up for Jimmy Song's course where you can make your own Bitcoin library from scratch, right? Yes, that's correct. So, okay. Yeah, uh, programmingblockchain.com. Uh, I'm also coming out with a book uh, based a lot on the seminar and uh, that's being published by O'Reilly. Uh, that should be coming out somewhere around March. So, so guys, now by saying this, we are signing off. You have a great day. Until next time, bye-bye. And don't forget to hit that like button.